Joining us on FriFest TV today, we have producer Jan Harlan, who is executive producer on several Stanley Kubrick films, including The Shining, which finally gets a full, uncut, 144-minute release here in the UK. Jan, welcome. Thank you. So, Warner Brothers originally felt the uncut version was too long. Um, is it a vindication now that it's finally coming out in the UK? I can't judge this. I really don't know. But what I do know is that The Shining has now become a classic, almost a cult film, and is much, much more popular now than it used to be when it came out, be it the shorter or the longer version. That seems to be a theme with uh, some of Stanley's films. I mean, well, that seems to be a theme with some of Stanley's films being appreciated yes, later. Yes, well, that's true. You see, uh, as an artist, and he clearly was an artist, you have to make sure you satisfy yourself first. It's very difficult, be it your composer or writer or a painter or a filmmaker, to make it for somebody else. You have to make it first for yourself. And you're stuck with your own judgment. And then you can only hope that you get enough of an audience and enough of the reviewers to be on your side and see what happens. Now, in this particular case, Warner Brothers felt after the film was released in the United States that it may have been be a, a touch too long. So, Stanley wasn't that stubborn, and he also wanted Warner Brothers to be pleased. He was a good trustee, you know, and so uh, he, he shortened it a bit. It doesn't really change the substance of the film, but there it is. What do you, what do you think he might have made of playing at a horror festival? Given that he's not, he wasn't the biggest horror fan. I, I can't answer that. I don't really know. I mean, he wants his films to be seen and to be liked by people. The Shining sticks out. But if you look at all his films, because it's the only horror film he made. It's in fact, it's the only film he made which isn't really about a serious social concern. Clearly, it's not. Yeah, but if you go back to Lolita or to Pass of Glory or to even you know, whatever, Dr. Strangelove, a very serious film, although it is a comedy, but uh, right to Eyes Wide Shut, they were always about a serious concern, very personal films. Um, the Shining is not, but it's okay. The Shining is there to give people a good time. Yeah? Well, it's, it's pretty serious when things get, get a bit dark in the middle. Um, I think it says, it says a lot that so many years later there is now a full cinema screen of mm. people today in 2014 watching 144 minutes of the film. Yeah, I think it's a wonderful film and it's very, very carefully made with tremendous love and passion as he always did. You know, he had the right to change the story from Stephen King's novel that was upfront clear. Uh, he wanted more ambiguity. He didn't want to explain anything, you know, to, uh, and, uh, and I think he succeeded. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he wasn't. He said that he wasn't uh, a huge horror fan. What, did he watch any horror films to prepare, or did he completely want to go his own way and make no, it his own? Yeah, he had the book, and he worked with somebody else, and uh, no, he didn't watch any other horror films. I mean, of course, he had seen horror films. I mean, he was a film buff. Yeah, but. Uh, he didn't look at any reference material. As you, if you look at The Shining, it has a totally different feel mm. from other horror films. Yeah. In fact, when you see the opening shot already, uh, you, you, you think you're looking at something about you know, the Rocky Mountains. Mm. It is the music that tells you instantly there's something wrong about what you're going to see because it clashes with the images. Well, he was an artist. Speaking of clashing, uh, telling a ghost story means it's not going to make it's not going to make a lot of sense, and it shouldn't make much sense. Um, so it kind of frees you up to to leave things in that don't that don't quite go together. So did that did that free him up? Do you think to to leave shots in that maybe didn't quite work, just but they, there was something strange about them? Oh no, I don't think so. I mean, yeah, in fact, I'm quoting Stanley Kubrick by saying, "Never explain anything that you don't understand yourself." <laughs> yeah. So you've said that the role of a producer is an organiser, so what was the most difficult thing you had to organise for Stanley? Oh, it's get things done, you know, by 
get permissions, uh, visit the second unit, for example. The, um, uh, Doug Milson, our camera operator, and myself, we were the only people who, who shot in Oregon the hotel in the snow. This was really filmmaking in the raw with a little 2C camera and a tripod and a set of lenses, yeah? Just the two of us. We did all the uh, establishing shots of the hotel. Somebody else did the helicopter shot in the beginning. Uh, Sandy wasn't there, but he was, of course, very clear in saying what he wanted. And, uh, yeah, so... Uh, was there, you don't, you don't have to answer this, was there anything... So that's one of the things I did. But the other thing is, is you have to get rights, to get the rights to music. I suggested music, I never chose. Mm -hmm. Whatever you see on the screen is really Stanley Kubrick, not me. Was there ever anything he asked for that you couldn't organize or couldn't arrange? Oh, I'm sure. I don't remember right now, but I'm sure there was something which uh, wasn't that easily obtained. Yeah, but that's normal. That's nothing special. Casting, for example, you might have a specific actor and he's not available, so you have to find somebody else. Uh, now, you and Christian oversaw the Kubrick exhibition, which is having a very nice world tour at the moment. Is there very a good exhibition. Any, Brilliant. Any chance it's going to come to the UK? I hope so. I really hope so. I mean, it's now, right now in Poland. It goes then to Toronto. We'll open in Toronto. Afterwards, it goes uh, to Korea, Seoul, and then San Francisco, I believe. And, well, maybe in 2016 or 17, there is still room. Uh, we could have it in London. I mean, it, after all, it was already in, in Rome, in Paris, in Zurich, in Berlin, in, in Melbourne, in uh, Sao Paulo, in, in Los Angeles, of course. And it's about time it comes to London. Mm. Mm. It's a great exhibition. I don't think there has ever been an exhibition about a filmmaker of this magnitude. Yeah, it's, I don't think so. It, it's, have you seen it? No, no, I was, I was in Los Angeles when it was on, um, but I, I, I was having meetings. Oh, you have still have a chance for the next three weeks, fly to Krakow. It's an easy jet, yeah, very simple. You're there in the morning, come back in the evening. It's well worth doing, if you're interested in these things. Stanley Kubrick is the only person I would take an easy jet flight for, so... <laughs> Good, <laughs> I think yeah. I'd have to go over. Yeah. Now, the invention of the Steadicam had a huge effect on cinema, and particularly The Shining. Yes. Um, are there any tool, in, any new filmmaking tools now that you think you might have really enjoyed? Well, oh. the whole digital revolution. Yeah, that I'm sure he would have enjoyed many, many aspects of the new electronic uh, uh, yeah, development. One clear benefit of the uh, digital projection is that the standard of cinema screen is far higher now than it used to be. I, I remember when Barry Lyndon came out, we were so worried. There was always this hot spot in the middle and, you know, two stops uh, down, left and right. This is all gone. It's now perfect and no scratches. And uh, 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 yeah, he would have liked that. No doubt about it. He famously would send people to investigate cinemas that were going to play his films. Don't I know it? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Well, it's important. I mean, you put so much effort into making a film, and then it should be seen in a bad condition. Of course not, with lousy sound and a hot spot in the middle. No, he suffered from that. He was very, very keen that the film should be seen in ideal conditions. I don't blame him. Oh, neither do I. <laughs> the first time I saw 2001, they showed it on TV, and they cut it off before The Star Child appears. So well, well, this it, is outrageous. It just doesn't make any sense. <laughs> this is outrageous. No, this is terrible. And 2001 is such a poetic, philosophical film. Really, the term um, science fiction is really not correct. Uh, in, in, in 2001, Kubrick really takes a bow to the unknowable. Yeah. <laughs> Are there, I mean, the, the Kubrick exhibition is, is touring now, are there any more um, hidden Kubrick archive items that we have yet to see? Any, uh... Oh, I don't know if they're hidden, but if you go to the exhibition, you will, you will see a lot that you don't know anything about. I mean, we prepared for a year a film on the Holocaust, yeah, which unfortunately wasn't made. We prepared AI, which he then gave it to Steven Spielberg, because he thought Steven Spielberg would be the better director for it. Uh, and um, so, yeah, and there were other things which we prepared. Yeah. The archive is very rich. He never threw anything away. 
Well, speaking of which, um, do you think we'll ever get his, uh, his boxes available to buy for us box fanatics? I want box, I don't know what you mean. He had a, a I saw in the, uh, there was a documentary about the archive where he had, he contacted a box company, a filing box, oh, to make his own special oh, boxes. Absolutely, all this, all this stuff is now at the University of the Arts in London, at Elephant and Castle. That's where the Kubrick archive is. And what is not there is in the exhibition. And what is not at either place, we'll throw away. <laughs> because these are private things and they should they, they, they are personal. We are very, very careful that only his professional stuff gets into the archive or the exhibition. Uh, this uh, final question, you, you might not know the answer because we, we never knew what he would do next and that was part of the joy of a new Stanley Kubrick project. You never knew what it would, what, what it would be. Um, if he was still alive and working today, what do you think might have been the next thing he made? It's very hard to say. Maybe he would have finally decided to work for television and do a series on Napoleon. Because Napoleon was a great, great interest to him. Not the historical facts, because everybody knows this. There's no, there are no secrets about Napoleon. There's nothing new to be discovered about the facts. What interested him was that nothing has changed. That this brilliantly talented man was also a fool. And uh, he had nobody else to blame for his downfall but himself. And there he was, 26 battles won. He came from nowhere from Corsica. He made himself emperor of France. He was hugely successful, made France enormously rich. But the first thing he should have done, and should have been on his pad as to-do list, make peace with England. And he failed. And that was his downfall. And it's very, very interesting that, that Kubrick thought this is what we have to focus on. Because that has been always a problem for all powerful figures. That they are not looking at their own Achilles heel. So, I, I would have loved to, have been, if he had a script written which doesn't really reveal that, that was really a script to be a good read, but I would have loved him to do that for television, not forcing him to do it in two and a half to three hours, but take ten hours, what's the difference? And right now, television actually star, uh, has begun with this long mm. series, it could go into details, doesn't matter how long it takes, six chapters, eight, ten chapters, doesn't matter. And uh, I think that's a very positive development. Yeah. Is there, I mean, you have a script and lots of material, is there a chance it could be turned into a TV project? Absolutely, now? absolutely, there is a chance. I mean, we, are, we, are, we, are hope, we hope it, it will happen. And um, the archive he has is so enormous and is so rich. Look, I have 17,000 photographs. I mean, there were copies of material pre-photography. Yeah, I mean, the, we have the slides, yeah? Mm. But we, we covered every museum, every book, every, every relative things, and it's very well organized. So, um, yeah, and an enormous research. And he, he really was a good student, and for two years he was working on Napoleon on the pre-production, and it was very sad when it didn't happen. But MGM pulled out because, although we had already a uh, an arra arrangement with the Ceausescu regime in Romania to do, maybe had the whole cavalry of Romania at that time, but then there was a Dina de Laurentiis film was, was greenlit and it, uh, you know, with George Steiger called Waterloo, it could have been a great film, I mean, you, know, you never know. I don't blame MGM for getting scared that Kubrick would then follow with sort of maybe a similar story. That's why they decided against it. Yeah, but then next step was we wanted to do Traum Novelle and we had already a contract with Warner Brothers so it was been the first film for Warner Brothers and then Stanley pulled out and that film became Eyes Wide Shut 30 years later. So yeah, take your time. There you go, well that was the most difficult film for him but he also uh, thought it was the, his greatest contribution really into filmmaking. Uh, uh, many people would not agree with him but it doesn't really matter, that's what he thought. Oh, I thought it was wonderful. I mean, it's going to, yeah, it's going to get rediscovered in time. It'll get rediscovered in time. Oh, I think so too. 
it's a, yeah, it's a great reference for, I think, future generations to look into our time. So, well, I hope we get to see the 10 part uh, Napoleon series on HBO. Wouldn't that be sometime? great? Wouldn't that be great? With digital armies. Mm, that would be wonderful. Okay, oh. that's all my questions. Jan Harlan, thank okay. you very much. You're most welcome. Okay, bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs> <laughs>